Hi, thank you. Oh, gosh. Christy tells me to make sure I know where my passage is before I get up here. Honestly, um, just to say that the most um, rewarding, though difficult part to preparing for a sermon is the conviction that comes with it. And I'm not, I don't dislike conviction. I don't love the feeling of it, but I do, I do use it as a reminder that I'm still a student in this relationship with Christ and that I still have room to grow. And I would hate um, to be in a place where I was no longer feeling convicted or um, I no longer had room to grow or every sermon was about somebody else and not about me um, because that would mean that I was probably in a really dark place. So I welcome the conviction and the way it came out when I was preparing for this sermon is that um, although I've been in the scripture for almost two months, it was August 26th that I turned to this and started reading and diving in, um, I met with Christy, Pastor Christy, last week about it on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, I was, I was telling her how confident I am with the presentation I had prepared. And she looked at me very seriously and said, yeah, those are usually our worst sermons. <laughs> she laughed too. She said she was kidding, but I, I don't think she was. Actually, I think what happened is that somebody who went before me turned around and warned me. And I'm no longer at the age where I have to learn from my own mistakes. I'm totally open to learning from others. Um, and so I took what she said seriously. And the, the truth is that she's absolutely right. Because if I had walked in here with any ounce of self-confidence to present this message, um, I might miss the opportunity to see God's will and the, the Holy Spirit moving through us to fulfill that. And I don't want to miss the opportunity. The irony of that is that that's what I'm preaching on today. I was preaching on the opportunity for us to get into the present, to see his will now, to watch the Holy Spirit move through us now. And so when it hit me Tuesday night, I started praying. I prayed Wednesday. I prayed Thursday. I prayed Friday. I prayed, God, tell me if this is not the way you want the message. If there's any part of this message that isn't of you, please tell me. And Friday, I felt like he basically just wiped the chalkboard. Like, nope, start over. And Friday, feeling that way, is a very scary place to be when you have a sermon on Sunday. So on Saturday, my husband sent me to the beach. That's where I reset. That's where I, that's where I know my God is really big. So I sat there and I journaled while I prayed. I was trying to journal. I was getting very little. Basically, what I got from him is to say, your job's to walk up there and see me do mine. And so I think that's the message. I think that what I would ask from all of you as we jump right into the scripture today is that we would just be here expecting that God's will is being done right this very second, that the Spirit's going to move through each one of us to fulfill that right now that we don't have to look back and see that it's already happened in life, and we don't have to anticipate when it's going to happen next, that it can happen right now as we proceed. And we're going to be visiting Acts 3, and that's a great place to be when we're talking about the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Acts 3. If you don't have a Bible, we have some in the back. If you don't own a Bible, keep it. This is a great place to learn about our Father's heart, and so keep it, put your name in it, write in it. It's our gift to you. As you're turning to Acts 3, I'll just tell you, catch up to speed, Jesus died, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and the Holy Spirit has come in like a wind. That happened in Acts 2. So the Holy Spirit has shown up, he's on the scene, and basically what's happening is evangelism's beginning. They're going out to spread the gospel, and that's where we pick up in Acts 3. We're going to be reading about um, John and Peter, Peter and John, as they're walking to the temple to do just that. And if you'll bear with me, I think what I'm going to do is just read my entire scripture instead of giving it to you in pieces, um, and it will make sense why I'm doing that later. Um, and then we'll, we'll dive in and dig in deeper as we go. So we're reading where it's, um, it starts off, Acts 3.1. One. one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. 
Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And there's a little bit of housekeeping before we jump in. I want all of us to really focus on how it is we can be present in God's will and let the Spirit work through us to fulfill it. But there's a little bit of housekeeping that has to take place first, and that's just, I'm going to go right into point one, um, if you're following along. Uh, God wants to use you. We have to know that God wants to use us. If we can't get that out of the way, um, then I don't think the rest of this message would make much sense to us. And for those of you who aren't at a place where you know that, we can use this, this passage to convince us because Remember, they're at the gates at the time of prayer. This beggar is at the gates at the time of prayer. He's carried there every single day. It's a good post if you think about it, right? Because it's highly frequented. frequented. People are showing up there at 3 o'clock. It's a great time to sit outside and beg. They've been bringing him there. He's been lame his whole life, and his friends have been bringing him there every day. Jesus frequented that very same place, and he wasn't healed by Jesus. The Spirit moved through Peter to heal him. God's will and God's timing was for it to happen at that moment. And, and what a splash it made. It was like God's way of saying, still at large and in charge, right? I mean, I'm still here. I'm still on the scene. I'm still doing what I said I was going to do. And he used Peter. And that's why it's in our Bible. So we have to get to that place of knowing he wants to use us before we can understand the rest. And then I think when I was, when I was reading this, what jumped out at me is the gate called Beautiful. I don't know why it struck me. I was praying, what is this gate called Beautiful? Why are you calling it that? What's that mean? And it was interesting because the more I researched and the more I journaled, the further away from the gate I got. It was kind of like I was being zoomed out. I was looking at the gate and wanted to know about the gate, but, but God was pulling me back and he was showing me things that were happening on either side of the gate. And then eventually he took me to the place that guides this message. He took me to the place of realizing that the priority focus, the primary thing happening here is that God's will is being done, the Spirit's moving through people to fulfill it. That's the primary. Everything else that happened on either side of the gates was secondary to that being the primary focus. So he zoomed me back off the gates and... And I think that we have to get to that place, really, as Christians, and especially if we look at Acts, because Acts is one of those places where people go and they find nuggets to help them define what church today is supposed to look like. And I think we all fall into that rut sometimes. We could read this and go, oh, he wants us to heal people. The Spirit's going to move through us. We're going to be the church that heals people. We're going to heal tons of people. And, that, and that's probably true. I believe God would honor that. But that's just a piece. That's just an isolated piece of what's happening here. It's, it's as if we think we can take a few isolated pieces from Scripture and do them here and expect what's happening here to happen here. And if we miss that overarching power, that primary purpose behind everything, then these little secondary things aren't going to work the way they do here. And so I felt like God was zooming me out and that Peter had to zoom out because think about this. Peter had a destination. Peter was on his way to work. He was going to go to the temples at 3 o'clock. He had a time to be there, right? He was going to spread the gospel at 3 o'clock at the gates. And as he's taking his step in the door, the, the lame man on his, who's not even at his post yet just kind of asks for some money. And I think about that in my own life. So I want to be to work at 7.30. I really want to be there at 7, but I start curling my hair on some days, and so it takes me a little longer. <laughs> but I want to be there at 7.30. And everything along the way that stops me from getting there at 7.30 is a distraction because I'm focused on my destination, right? 
But in this case, the destination was the temple. For Peter, that was the destination. But for God's will, it was something happening outside that temple. And it really hit me like a ton of bricks yesterday. I was still wondering what I was going to say today. Sitting at the pool with my son, he's nine. And, um, and he's, I'm thinking all about this sermon. God, what do you want me to say? I still don't know what I'm going to say. Tell me what you want me to say. And he's saying, do you want me to jump in like a wrestler with a wrestler move? Or do you want me to act out a movie scene while I jump in? And then I would pick one of those. And then he would go, okay, do you want the... I can't even pretend to come up with um, wrestling names, but he would give me like three wrestling options. And then, and I'm not hearing him because I'm so focused on this sermon. And all of a sudden I said, God, okay, zoom me out, zoom me out. And when he zoomed me out, what I was focused on, the sermon, wasn't what he was focused on. When he zoomed me out, I could see that what I was supposed to be doing is investing in my child. When he zoomed me out, I could see that, you know what? What happens right now could impact what kind of man he's going to be. What kind of father he's going to be. And then he got very sweet and kind and zoomed me gently back in so I could spend time with my son. And that's what I did and it was wonderful. And that's what Peter had to do. He had to zoom out and realize that his destination wasn't necessarily where God was calling him. And point number two is look for the father in your journey, not in your destination. And it's precisely what was happening with the gate for me. The gate was my distraction. And I, and I believe it plays out as one through here. We, we have to be able to hear what he wants from us too. Because if you look at Peter, wasn't distracted by his destination. He did right. He followed God's will. He was prepared and willing and in the present to let the Spirit work through him to fulfill it. But how did he know what it was? Right? Because, because the guy begging was asking for money. And Peter could have given him money. He could have given him food. He could have just prayed for him. He could have done what some of us do and just say, I have no change. I'll give it to you on the way back out of the grocery store. He could have done anything like that and it still would have been a nice thing to do. But he didn't do that. He did what he was supposed to do. And you think about it, even like the friends who carry the mat, right? So the friends, every single day of this man's life, are carrying the mat to the gates for him to beg. Those are nice friends. They're selfless friends. They bring him there every single day. But really, they're bringing him back to an empty place in his life every single day. If you were here two weeks ago, you heard Pastor Christy preach on friendship, and she described a similar style of friendship where the friends carried the mat up onto a roof and dropped it through a ceiling so they could bring their friend to Jesus to be healed. She said, that's the kind of friends I want, the friends that bring me to Jesus. So although the friends looked like they were doing a good thing, it wasn't the thing, right? And so we have to be prepared and open to the thing. And Peter literally files bankruptcy in the earthly battle. And that's one of the lessons I think we can learn from him here. He says, I, I don't have what you're asking for. I don't have silver or gold. The thing that you think you need in the flesh, I can't give you. But he didn't forget that there was a spiritual option. And I think that helps us in those times that we feel empty to realize we have something to give. I'll go ahead and give point three, and I want to. Then I want to. I just want to stay here a little longer. But it's good actions without the good news still leaves them begging. He healed him. It wouldn't have made it into this book had he not. So for me, I feel like. I said yes to Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He wrecked my world. He put it back together nice his way. And since then, I've been blessed with a beautiful, what I'm starting to refer to as a pretty little Christian life. I have a great job in a Christian environment. I have a beautiful family that I was never taught, taught to have. It's just God's blessing in my life. And I get to be a part of this church, God's blessing in my life. But I started picturing yesterday my life in like a snow globe. And you can shake it up, but it stays the same, you know? And so when you're living what looks like God's will for your life, 
is there a possibility that you still might not hear what he's called from you? I mean, is there still a possibility that what I'm doing every day isn't exactly what he's asking of me? I'm doing good stuff, but is it possible that I might not be able to hear what he wants from me? And I would say yes. I would say that the pretty little Christian life that I live is a very dangerous place to be. It was my first uh, matter of conviction when I dug through here. And I sketched out a little presentation, and I'm going to go ahead and go uh, with it and see if you guys will play along. But it's kind of to depict, because I suspect I'm not the only person in here that could fall into that same place of comfortability in my, in my faith. Um, so, but I'm going to need some volunteers. Um, the first volunteer is going to represent the still small voice, the Holy Spirit in my life. So I need somebody who would do that well. No, Ed. <laughs> I had imagined Nell and she's not here. So anybody? No. Yes, Brittany. Brittany is a perfect still small voice. Okay, so you're going to take that longest string. Uh, yeah. Keep rolling back. Let the others just hang. Ed had to unknot this for me because it was all knotted up in my bag. Like, great idea. I, was, I thought, oh, he doesn't want me to do it. Okay. <laughs> so Brittany's the still small voice. Will you just give her a chair? I would have her sit on the ground, but she's dressed so pretty. And I'm on, this, I'm on this walk with her. I really am. I'm committed to it. I turn my eyes to you all the time. I do. And, and the still small voice is always telling me, be still, Fawn. Just be still. Know I'm God. And because I've been on this path, I've been blessed with some beautiful things, like I mentioned, one of them being my job. So who wants to represent my job? I thought you'd want to represent my family. That could be dangerous. Yeah. OK. So who wants to represent my job? Chad? You get to stand. Um, Stram, you're on the path. You know, this is what I this is what I came to realize is that if if there's something in your life that's not on this path, uh, you'll know, right? It'll be so far away from that still small voice that you'll know. But because the things I'm doing are so a blessing of being on this path, I say just tuck yourself in a little. Yeah, there you go. You're right on track. And then um, somebody for my family, Edward. <laughs> this is my husband. For those of you who don't know eager to participate. I told him earlier he couldn't, but he wins. So you're on this path too. You're definitely a blessing in my life. Get in here. Tuck in, guys. Tuck in. All right. I might have made those two close together. I need one more big one, uh, church. How about Roy? You want to come up? He was scared I was going to call on him. Look. Big blessing, right? Church. This church. Okay, so tuck in here because you're right on the path. So, nice. This is good. So do you guys, you see I'm on the path. I have all these beautiful blessings. This is great, right? There's, who's my job? You are? Chad's my job. Okay, so there's the beautiful Christian environment that I work in, St. Matthew's House, just selfish plug. Um, miracles happen there, and I get to witness them every day. It, th that's no joke. There are people in this room who will, will tell you that I'm not lying. It, it's amazing. And everybody who works there thinks, I get to work here. But here's the truth about what goes on in my head. It's still a job sometimes. And I'm in fundraising. And for those of you who don't know, fundraising can be a very vulnerable place to be in a nonprofit. And the nonprofit runs on the money that I bring in. And sometimes, especially in the summer in Naples, that gets really difficult. And then sometimes I feel like I'm underappreciated. Everybody just wants to give me ideas. They want to tell me how to do my fundraising. They have great ideas. Everybody has really good ideas. But they're, they're not part of the manpower that gets it done. They just come by and drop ideas in my office and walk away. And then, and then if I prayed about it, I'm sure that still small voice would say, be still and know that I'm God. But I can't hear that still small voice because all I hear is the nagging. These I'm underappreciated. Nobody's listening. I have great ideas. I actually went to college for it, but nobody wants to hear what I have to say. And so now I'm getting ready to drive home. 
And I love my home. I'm so excited because the way I remember home is that I walk through the door and my little kids come running up and greeting me and hug me and kiss me and missed me. And my husband's there and he's so excited I'm home. But sometimes that's not what happens when I walk through the door. Forgive me. I love you. <laughs> sometimes I walk through the door and they're all really just busy doing life. You know, the teenager's locked in his room. The little one's on the computer. Hi, mom. Ed's doing something and he, you know, says hi. It's fine. He's nice. And then what happens is I decide to entertain myself. So I open up The Sims and I start looking at all the little people in the little town I've created and I make sure they haven't gone to the bathroom on the floor and I'm really engaged or I'm on Facebook and I start getting wrapped up in the politics. I don't know, should we bake them a cake? I don't know. What side of the coin am I on? And I see all the venom and I see everybody hating each other and I decide I'm going to respond. And I start typing my response, and it's, it's all from my mind. I'm coming up with all these great things I'm going to say, powerful things that are going to advance the kingdom. And then one of them decides to interrupt me, because now they want my attention. And I get angry, and I get frustrated. And if I listened, I'd probably hear the Father say, be still, and know that I am God. But instead, I just hear all that chaos and noise, and then a, a fight erupts, and I think, this is not what I imagined when I got home, so I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to control this. And then everybody's fighting with me. And then I go to church on Sunday, probably to beg for forgiveness. <laughs> And I, I live for this church. I love it. We moved here a year ago to be part of the Naples Vineyard, and it's a beautiful place to be with beautiful people. And, and God's really working here, and big things are coming out of this place. And I don't want to miss them. I'm so excited to be a part of it. But sometimes we do a lot of work here to get it set up. And you might not see it when you walk in, but it's a lot of work before you get here. And sometimes I feel like I'm doubling up on responsibilities and I want to ask someone to help me and they tell me no, Danny. And then <laughs> we've, got, we've gotten through it, otherwise I couldn't use them as an example. And so then I yell at a friend, I yell at him and I'm so mad at you, Danny. And then, I, and then I'm texting Lumi later because I'm living with this guilt. Lumi, please ask Danny to forgive me, I feel so terrible. And, and all of this just is in my mind, I'm consumed and then tomorrow I have to go back to work and all of that noise comes back and I'm pretty certain that if I just listened, I would hear, be still. Silence, all of that. And this is what I've learned. What we feed grows. And what we starve doesn't. So if this is your pretty Christian life and you're not hearing from God, then this is what you need to do. Stop listening to this. Starve this. I'm going to ask you to shrink, <laughs> if you can. Maybe step away, pretend you shrunk. Listen to this. Okay, and whatever, which one of you, stop feeding those thoughts, shrink, feed this one, feed this relationship right here, and Britt, you can grow, you can grow now, <laughs> because if this is what I'm listening to, that's going to grow, and I'm going to shrink, because I'm not in charge, I'm not lording over these pieces of my life, they are absolutely blessings that come from this relationship, from this walk, and, and that she'll honor that, he'll honor that. <laughs> Sorry, slip. <laughs> It'll be honored in all of what the Holy Spirit and all of what God and all of what my faith has to offer is going to flow down here nicely. It won't be difficult. It'll be beautiful. And I'll be able to hear what I'm supposed to hear, which is be still and know that I am God. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> and hopefully I didn't offend anybody that I have to apologize to later. <laughs> Are we good? We're good, Danny? Good, okay. <laughs> Peter had to do that. Peter had to stop the noise. He was probably having great conversation with his friend. They're all excited. The Holy Spirit just showed up. It's a big deal. But he had to stop that, and he had to do what was being called from him. So we have to be available to listen. And I mentioned that the gate, the gate is what drew me in. And the gate is what I kept getting pulled away from. But just like I was brought back down to focus on Colin, it just hit me like a ton of bricks that the gate is the message. The gate called beautiful is what we came to talk about today, really. The gate, what I thought was my focus for the message, was a distraction from seeing the bigger picture. But when we come back down to the gate, what do we learn? We learned that what was supposed to happen inside the gate called beautiful 
where all the beautiful stuff was, what was supposed to happen inside there to impact what was happening outside the gate, ugly, a lame beggar, actually happened in reverse. Because Peter was willing to zoom out and zoom back in where God put him, right? He was outside the gate where it was ugly. And what happened outside the gate brought itself inside the gate and impacted it in huge ways. And just think about our church that way. That's the gate called beautiful. I just feel like this is calling us to, to let, let it flow in. Let what's happening out there impact us in beautiful ways. Don't keep it locked up inside here. And that's our final point, actually. Beautiful was no longer separated by a gate. So we will do these things. We will do these things that they talk about in the Bible. We'll do these things that those who started evangel evangelistic churches for us, we'll do those things. But we'll do them because God's willed them and because the Holy Spirit's moving in us to fulfill that. Now let's pray. Oh, Father, you are so good. You show up, and thank you. And I know, I know sometimes we're the lame man sitting outside the gate. And so, uh, sorry if I spoke to a room full of Peters, Lord. I just know that every once in a while, every one of us is the lame man outside of the gate. So, Lord, for those of us who feel like we're sitting out there right now, I just pray that you, uh, you bring people to them, Lord, that you bring workers in their path, that you bring them friends that won't just bring them back to empty every day. Bring them friends that will bring them to you. And Father, for, for any of them that are sitting outside of our gate, for any of them that are sitting out there feeling like they don't belong in here, Lord, welcome them. Bring them in. Show us how. Give us the words to take what's happening inside here out there so that you're not just a Sunday God for us, Lord. Let us stay present, Lord. Let us stay right here and available for what you have for us today, right now. And Lord, for those here who, uh, who haven't accepted you as their, as their Lord, I just pray this, and if you'll pray along with me, just Father, just come into my heart, just Lord. Mm. I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior, and I want him to rule my world, and I want to do these things. I want to be Peter in somebody's life, Lord. I want to be used by the Spirit. Use me, God. I say yes to you. And for those of us, Lord, who are living those pretty Christian lives, just silence the noise in our head. It's so hard for us to do that ourselves, but Lord, just silence that noise and, and let us hear you. Let us rest in what you tell us, God. In Jesus' name we pray.